Hello and welcome to episode 167 of Page One of the Writers Podcast. I'm Marco. I'm Derek. And thanks for joining us on the podcast where we like to speak to writers of all kinds about their writing careers, find out how they got into the industry and try and get as many hints and tips from them as possible. Uh, and uh, as I always say, we've got a great pack catalogue of guests there, so please do check that out if you haven't already. But we have a brilliant guest this week as well. Yeah, this week we're chatting with the wonderful uh, Veronica Henry, who uh, has had a really interesting route in, uh, as so many of her guests do. Uh, she started writing professionally uh, for The Archers, the Radio 4 uh, radio drama. Um, and then she, she moved from that into TV writing. She, she wrote to script editors on shows like Crossroads and Boone. She's had freelance script success with shows like Heartbeat and Holby City. And she's moved into the world of novels after that. So really, you know... A lot of writing and across different genres and media. Yeah, and as you say, an interesting path in. And we yeah. chat to her a bit about the differences between writing for TV and writing novels. Um, so we will get straight into it after our advert for a writer's notebook. And then we'll be back at the end of the podcast with a bit more chat and to let you know about next week's guest. But for now, on with the podcast. The blank page. To some, it's terrifying, an obstacle to overcome. But we prefer to think of it as an opportunity, a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head. So how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is, write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read. Or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? Structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise it's not just a story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made page one. Page one is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. And then afterwards, once it's written, we realized you need to plan how to let people read it. So we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project, whether you want to write a book, screenplay, a comic, or any other kind of story. We truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, Every story starts with page one. Did you always want to be a writer? I think so, yes. I didn't really sort of um, dream about anything else. I was always a bookworm. I think most writers are. I think that's how we (laughs) get sucked into the process. Um, And I just, that yeah, that was my world very much. Um, Certainly until I was a rebellious teenager. That was my escape (laughs) before other more nefarious activities took over <laughs> um so yeah as as most writers probably do I probably had a little notebook that I scribbled down in or you know when I learned to type that was pretty exciting <laughs> you know on a proper old-fashioned typewriter yeah, yeah. well I, I, I <laughs> was re- real somehow <laughs> I, I was reading that yeah you your first I think it was your first writing job was writing for the archers but that was on the old school typewriter that you were yeah my first scripts. my first job was actually typing archer scripts so right. okay. yeah so um it, it would take two and a half hours to type one out and yeah it was on a originally a, an old-fashioned typewriter and then we got olivetti et 121s which had an 11 character memory right okay. revolutionary wow. <laughs> <laughs> Game changer. i know it seems bizarre doesn't it <laughs> That was very exciting. So how did you get into that job? How did that come about? Okay, so um, I did go to university. I studied Latin, which might seem strange, but actually as a wordsmith, it's incredibly useful because it 
teaches you the power of words and is very, very disciplined actually as well. So with a Latin sentence, you can only write it in a certain order. And if you change the order of those words, the, the meaning changes dramatically. Okay. It really does make you focus on how you're using words. Um, I did actually get asked to leave. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> There's a story enough. here. <laughs> yeah. Um, I didn't work hard enough, I think, probably. Nothing terrible. I didn't sort of burn the university down or anything. Um, and then that that's when I went off and did a secretarial course um and then just happened to notice an advert for the for the archers um in the i was living in the midlands and it was set at, based at pebble mill and i thought that sounds fun <laughs> and the rest is history i just kind yeah. of walked over the doorstep into ambridge um and kind of really fell in love with storytelling then um yeah. because i realized how important it is for everybody to escape to have some sort of an escape uh and just I used to answer all the fan mail, for example, as well. Um, and it just became really apparent that at five past seven every night, which was when it went out in those days, um, people just loved switching off and listening to other people's stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. I'm, I'm right saying as well, you actually got involved in sort of like the, I think the technical terms, the Foley, but like making sound effects and all that sort of stuff. Yes, from, from yeah, that. yeah. I mean, yes, I, I was the production secretary, but you, you never knew what you were going to be asked <laughs> So yeah, classic example. Phoned up and said, "Oh, we need some newborn be the sound of some newborn baby piglets. Can you sort that out?" It's like, yeah, no problem. <laughs> so you, I, I never actually realised how it works. You basically would just get a call and you wouldn't have a clue what it was for or anything. They would just say, "We want this sound effect by whatever date," and you go over and try and work out a way to create that sound effect or to find yeah. It. I mean, mostly it was the um, sound department's job to do that, obviously. But I think I, I sort of somehow got ro roped into yeah. I'd get a sound engineer and then I'd phone around the farms and say, <laughs> "How old are your piglets? <laughs> <laughs> Can we send someone around right. to record them?" Yeah, and then off we'd go. It was really sweet, and then we'd have oh. my, I don't know, but, you know, Princess Margaret was on and. <laughs> It was just, you just didn't know what was going to happen next, really. <laughs> <laughs> so, Piglets one day, Princess Margaret the next. <laughs> and, and and then after that, you moved into uh, sort of the world of TV. I, I think you were a script editor uh, yeah. on, on, on shows like Crossroads. Um, what does a script editor ac actually do? What, what did that involve in the day-to-day? -day? Well, I know it's hard to believe that Crossroads had a script editor, but... <laughs> <laughs> Having a renaissance at the moment, thanks to Helena Bonham Carter and um, the lovely show about Noel Gordon, who was its sort of leading lady. Um, so a script editor basically commissions the scripts, helps out with the storylining, um, then edits the scripts, literally, you know, kind of makes sure that they're pacey, far, you know, mm. interesting, that there's a good cliffhanger. Um, but also liaise with like the costume director, uh, the costume department about what everybody should be wearing i think my favorite bit of the job was going to casting sessions actually um mm. so yeah i was quite lucky in that on that particular show the script editors were quite hands-on with everything like sh shaping how the yeah. show and felt so yeah and a really again a really good training for writing books eventually mm -hmm. because you're juggling you're juggling so much you're you know you're you're planning commissioning editing and then looking at what's going on in the studio and then making sure it's all you know watching the actual broadcast so you're kind of your mind's all in 17 different places yeah at having to juggle everything essentially yeah, yeah. exactly so writing novels like really easy after that. <laughs> <laughs> i mean it sounds like a kind of a very unusual route that you've taken into the kind of script writing world that you've that you've found yourself in at, at that point and was you know with the whole time you're going through you know the archer stuff and then the sound effects stuff would, would you did you always think i want to keep moving myself or i want to keep positioning myself so i can get into the actual writing things um actually i was kind of heading for producing um okay. and then guess what i had a baby <laughs> <laughs> um and tv and babies don't go particularly well together if okay. if you know, it's a very demanding, um, well, certainly in those days, it, and we were talking like my oldest son is 32 now. So it was a long time ago um, and you know, it was tough. And I was really lucky and I just thought, actually, I'm just going to jump over the fence and do a bit of a poacher turn gamekeeper and mm. do some writing, which I knew I could do from home. Fondly fondly imagining that the baby would sleep in a motor. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> which obviously isn't quite what happens. But <laughs> and and, yeah. and when you're when you're doing scripts for for shows like you were writing for, I think you were writing for shows like Heartbeat and Hopi City and things like that. Um, yeah. How much freedom does the writer have? Like, how much is are you being given guidance on? Right, we need a script that does this, or how much of your own idea can you bring into a script like that? Okay, so um, so I was working mostly on what's known as continuing series, which have uh, you know, the, so the series will have a, a series arc which you have to follow, which which is based around the main characters, you know, the, the consistent characters. But then within each episode, you'd have a guest story to tell those stories through. So if, if for Holby, it would be a medical story. For Heartbeat, it was sort of crime or what, you know. And there'd usually be two or three plots as well. So you'd have an A story, a B story and a C story. Um, so, yeah, you were whilst you were given a certain amount of material that you had to adhere to because it had to pick up from the previous episode and follow on to the next one and be in keeping with the tone of the show, you also had the creative um, freedom to create your own characters, guest characters, if you like. Okay. Yeah. So it's quite so, a juggling act. <laughs> yeah, it sounds it. And, and so, so would you kind of be be told, right, so characters A and B aren't speaking, they've had a fight, and so you'd yeah. have to keep that animosity going because exactly. someone else will resolve it in three episodes' time or whatever. So you just kind of... Exactly, keep exactly. Moving. Yeah. But you'd use your guest stories to, you know, so if it was a Holby City story you know, maybe two consultants were disagreeing over the treatment of a particular patient, you'd just be given that as a story brief and then you'd have to find an interesting story that was a guest story to play out their kind of antagonism or their com competitiveness or yeah. the fact and, that one's going to make a terrible mistake and the other's going to go, I told you so, whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, I mean, that all of that grounding that you've had there must have given you a brilliant sort of, you know idea of how to structure stories and how to you know bring characters in and all of that sort of stuff it must be a brilliant route into novel writing which we'll get onto in a moment yeah I mean the thing that it teaches you is discipline and the interesting thing about television is is how there's so many restrictions that you don't necessarily think about you know you've got to tell that story within a certain amount of time 52 minutes or an hour depending on whether you're writing for ITV or BBC. Mm -hmm. um, you've got budgetary restrictions. You can't just put a, an aeroplane or a, or a trip to Paris or, yeah. you know, it's, it's got to stick to the budget. Uh, you've yeah. got to restrictions. So you'll be told, right, you can have these characters, but that one's on holiday and that one's pregnant or whatever. Um, and then set set restrictions as well. So, you know, you there's very often logistical reasons why you can't go to a certain place. Um and you get a mixture of of kind of studio based scenes and then what's called OB outside broadcast when when the crew is taken out some you know in heartbeats mm -hmm. it'll be onto the you know Yorkshire or whatever yeah. so so yeah it, there's so many restrictions writing a book is actually quite daunting because you think well if I want to go to Paris I can yeah that's right yeah, some way pounds, I can freedom. if I want to have an entire army charging over the hill I can <laughs> and, <laughs> Which is I, odd. <laughs> and I suppose you're you know you're much more as you're saying there's much more of a collaborative kind of ethos going on with the script writing because you've got these people saying you can't have this you can't have that you've got to fit here's what's here's the overarching plot fit your writing into the jigsaw puzzle of the series you know i mean is that a good thing is that did you find that quite a helpful process or was it quite difficult sometimes gosh the feedback it that really really varied i mean sometimes you always knew when you delivered your first draft draft and they went oh this is great you know we just need a couple of tweaks but that was all going to go horribly wrong any minute <laughs> all apart um uh, I do miss the collaboration, actually. That that was quite, you know, it, you know how solitary writing is. Um, mm -hmm. So that was, as, on a personal level, that was great, having some people to talk to and bounce off and have to work with. Um, but then it could be frustrating because there would often be reasons, it, you know, an executive producer would come in and go, I don't like that storyline, let's get rid of it and you'd have to start again and you'd just think well what you know what it seems to be working what's the problem but that there, there'd be an issue um yeah. so there would be things that would pop up that were out of your control if you like which doesn't tend to happen with a with your own novel you know people don't just sort of randomly yeah 
object to something that then has a knock-on effect to what you're writing so yeah <laughs> and and so so what at what stage did you think right I want to actually try my hand at, at, at novel writing um so as I, I'd always loved books it, it felt much more of a natural medium for me because the thing about script writing is it's not really about words it's not about adjectives it's not about beautiful writing at all it's a it's a template that you hand over to a group of people to do more with mm -hmm. um so, so obviously the structure is really important um and the dialogue etc but it's not about yeah creating a beautiful sentence right mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of what i quite often worked in development which is when you um you know you're thinking of new tv show ideas and and we'd we'd i'd write a bible and characters and p possible storylines and whenever anybody read it they were like you should be you should be writing books <laughs> like, <laughs> and i just thought yeah you know what i think i probably should <laughs> um so i know it sounds really pat but i i just sat down and wrote half a book and i was really lucky it's a very annoying kind of unhelpful story in that my tv agent worked with a literary agent um and introduced me so i got an agent and then my, and got a book deal with penguin yeah although i mean you say you were lucky well, you've been work, easy, working yeah. for years exactly yeah. <laughs> you know it's not like it you it just plucked randomly I no 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 you put I in the legwork i think it's i feel right like i did for my training you know, like yeah. my bones as they said <laughs> um and so i think that was in 2000 you got your first book yeah, deal, is that right was, yeah 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 um and so when when that came about and uh, the first book uh was it was it a country Christmas? Was that the first book? Yeah, it was actually called the first. It was originally called Honeycutt, which is the name of the village it's set. Right. In. Okay. It's had a title change, <laughs> <laughs> um, just to confuse everybody. Um, but yeah, so that was the first one. Yeah. Uh, which... uh, and uh, obviously, since then, you've been like hugely prolific since since yeah, that I... first book was published. I mean, I, I was looking at the. I, I I never know how accurate these things are when I look them up on the internet, but. There looks to have been one year where you had at least three, if not four, books out. I think. In, oh gosh, in a they might year. not have been full-length novels, or they might right. have okay. issues and things. But yeah, I've basically written a, a book a year since then, rough, roughly. Right. That okay. Tally's at it. So I think I'm on book twenty-three now. That would make sense. And and when you when you wrote that first novel, did you just think, right, this is this is where I want to be. This is what I want to be doing. I, just, I did love it. I just loved being in control of everything and creating a world and dictating what everybody looked like and ate and smelt like and mm -hmm. who they were having an affair with. Or It just was, I just felt like the controller. I felt in control all of a sudden um, without wanting to sound like a control freak, but it was just very nice to be the master of everybody's destiny. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, I mean, what's your process then you know what's your do you have a kind of schedule time that you sit down and write or do you kind of just squeeze it in amongst your daily routine what's your, oh, what's your process? well I have to treat it as a business it's a business to be yeah. honest um okay. you know, that's how I make my living <laughs> that's how I keep a roof over my head and I mean my children are grown up now but I like to throw them the odd <laughs> 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 Easter egg um <laughs> and it's so weird just as we were talking about Honeycutt and I was thinking back do you know what I really didn't think about how I wrote it I just sat down and wrote it mm. um and I was very confident which is odd isn't it I just felt it but I think perhaps it was because in those days there was no internet mm -hmm. and you like now I find when you're on Twitter or anywhere everything's over analyzed and it's like how do you do it what's the magic trick and you should be doing this there's a lot of you know this is how it should be kind yeah, of yeah a lot of gatekeeper type stuff. Yeah. yeah and i've i found that really inhibiting and i start thinking oh, well i don't do that and I so i think one of my biggest um tips would be to not overthink it in a way mm -hmm. um and every book i write i write differently um i think i do a lot of it in my head because i had that brain training from telly um of you know keeping yeah. so many different stories um and I do, I do plan out to a certain extent. I like a route map. Um, and sometimes I write chronologically. Sometimes I quite often do dual timelines. So sometimes I'll 
kind of flip between the two. Right. Okay. If I'm really into one of them. I'll just keep going and then splice them together at the end. Um, so, I mean, with that process, that's interesting. I mean, do you, you know, when you, when you get to the end of your first draft, um, is it is it pretty clean or is there quite a lot of work that you need to do to sort of um, work it into shape? I tend to get my editor on board earlier than I used to because I think there's much more, um, I think there's, I think we're much more answerable to our editors and our readers nowadays. I don't think, I think back in the day, you kind of pretty much wrote what you wanted and <laughs> floated off. <laughs> Whereas now I think the expectation, the reader's expectations are much more specific um, and everything's much more marketed. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, I tend, I mean, I write something that's perfectly readable, but isn't perfect. And I know yeah. it's perfect. And I kind of think, right, I'm not going to dig down too much into any of it until I know that the structure works. Yeah. So I send in, you know, kind of, yeah, a first draft that is, there's a, a structure in place that works and lots of emotional, you know, comings and goings and turmoils, but it's not perfect because I haven't spent, I haven't perfected it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean, does, because we've had other guests on as well and they say, obviously after a certain number of books or whatever, they're, they will get to like you, they'll get a, the draft to a stage that they're, you know, they're happy with, but they know it needs work and they'll yeah. get input on from it and that. And they, they, do, they don't get too concerned about it because they've written, you know, they have the experience of having been in that position before and knowing that they can do it. Whereas I think if you're starting out, oh. you can get too obsessed that it, this has to be the best thing ever. Otherwise, yeah, no one's absolutely. going to want this. Well, yes, I mean, it, it is. a diff Yeah, I suppose I, I know I have enough confidence in myself to know that they're not going to be horrified by what I've sent yeah. in. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> I'll definitely have opinions about how to make it better that don't necessarily naturally come from me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they might be focusing more on something that they feel makes it a more, more emotionally satisfying in, in a particular direction. Um, so, yeah, but you have to be tough. You have to learn how to take criticism. And I mean, I've just had my notes through today, for example, on my next book and, uh, like you feel completely overwhelmed to start with because it's you're mm. somebody else's complete take on something that you spent a long time writing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um and you and they may make suggestions that you just think, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. Um and the trick then is to go, well, why have they suggested that? What is the reason underneath it? What is the what is it that they want? And how do I make that into my way of telling that story? Yeah. Uh -huh. which is it's quite a process and sometimes you just have to admit you're wrong <laughs> and go away in terms with that you know it's it's about picking your battles and then yeah. uh, you know just seeing it from somebody else's point of view because your editor is your reader basically mm -hmm. so they are that you know they have a very valid viewpoint mm -hmm. and you have been immersed in that story and you you kind of may have missed things that clarify the story or have so fallen in love with something that's completely nonsensical <laughs> that I mean, as, as, it, <laughs> it's, a, it's a difficult balancing act though isn't it because yeah. you, you, you have to have your own you know confidence in your own story and the story that you wanted to tell at the start but also as you say editors are experienced they know what they're talking about and, yeah. and they're trying to help you get get the book into yeah. the best shape possible but that yeah. definitely can yeah. conflict sometimes there's no doubt Exactly. They're not just being difficult or mm -hmm. you know, controlling at all. They're just thinking, oh, actually, I think this could be much more rewarding and more exciting. Um, so, yeah, I just need two or three days to mull it over, definitely, to kind of. Um, and then other things, you know, other things can come out of that and you, you'll some amazing sort of um, brainwave will appear and you think, actually, all of these points, if I did this, that would address all of that. But it's not mm -hmm. necessarily what was suggested. But it's yeah. I think that's that's a really key point, isn't it? That often what's flagged up as a problem, that's not necessarily the actual problem. That's maybe something earlier which you need to tweak. Yeah. It's, it's maybe alluding to something which isn't working right earlier on. Which when you make that change, suddenly that what was once a problem is now perfectly fine because it's been set up properly or whatever. Exactly. But and know. it can be brilliant the way it all just falls into place. You just think, oh, by making that person maybe the opposite of what they are you know it just has a 
ripple effect throughout the whole. Exactly. Yeah. So, ah, I love what it. About, <laughs> I mean, I mean, what about the opposite when you've got writer's block and you think I do not know how to make this work or I just cannot get the words properly or the scene's not working. I don't know why. What do you do when you're really stumped well, at these moments? Um, if I've sort of written myself into a corner and just think, oh, this doesn't feel right. If it's a sort of small block, I, I just go and walk the dog, take the dog to the beach mm -hmm. go muttering along the cliff top <laughs> <laughs> like a mad one, <laughs> acting it all out. And and eventually it sort of teases its way out somehow. Um, yeah. And luckily, I, um, I think sometimes... One thing I've noticed, I certainly haven't written 23 books, is sometimes I guess just get bored. I bore mm. myself with what I'm writing and I just think, because I know what's going to happen at the end, you know, it's sort of not exciting to me. So that's a, that's that's my biggest sort of, oh, why would anyone, you know, I think, why would anybody want to read this? It's <laughs> tedious. But of course it is because I've been thinking about it and yeah. that's what I struggle with more than an actual block. It's just a sort of, oh, this just doesn't feel it. It's not fizzing it needs to fizz a bit more the, the next idea is always the always the oh yes one. that thing <laughs> yeah. realizing new idea yeah, yeah. exactly and and i mean are you you say you do a, about a book a year i mean is that does that sort of contractual pressure help you focus on getting it done in the time that you need to get it done yeah yeah i mean i like a deadline definitely mm -hmm. And what, am I, what else am I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think with with a book a year, and now I'm in hardback and paperback. Um, it it I have to hit that because that's what my readers want. You know, it's a very specific. That book's coming out at that time. That's coming out at that time. We can't mess about with it. So it's quite um, useful to have that. Yeah. You know, I can't just mess about and not deliver. It's, there's a lot of things that have to happen to to hit those two publications. Yeah. yeah. Every year, well, it's a big team. You know this. <laughs> it's a big team waiting to sort out covers and you know, yeah, copy edits and the whole shebang. So, well, your latest book is Thirty Days. Um, so, why don't you tell us what that book's about? Yeah, th this is so. This is Thirty Days in Paris, which is about a fifty-something-year-old woman who has amicably separated from her husband. He's gone down the marathon <laughs> cycling rock climbing route. <laughs> That's not her thing at all. She wants to <laughs> the theater in the wine bar and, you know, <laughs> stumble home in a taxi. So they've just kind of you know, gone their separate ways. And she basically thinks, right, I'm going to revisit my, my youth. She went to Paris as a 20 year old, fell in love with it, fell in love as well. Um, it all went wrong and she's never been back. And now she rents an apartment for 30 days to rediscover herself, find out who she wants to be. And actually she's writing a book as well. She's a ghostwriter, but now it's her turn to write her own novel, <laughs> which is quite <laughs> an interesting leap. Um, yeah, so it's all about her going back and it's again, dual timeline. So we go back with her to when she's 20, find out what, what went wrong. And, and, and your novels are all, um, I suppose, use the word that you used earlier, sort of escapism, uh, which is an important thing for, as you say, for, for books to be able to do, to transport you to yeah. that different world and, and, you know, become the, so that you don't want to put the book down and, and see what, what's happening to the characters. I mean, yeah. how do you how do you generate that in your writing? How do you generate these ideas that you think this is what someone will want to read? Gosh, I mean, it's usually where I want to go. I, I've always wanted to set a book in Paris anyway. I kind of just had to wait for the right story to come along for that. It's, it's just somewhere I've always wanted to go. And yeah, then then that sort of, I suppose it's because of my age, that kind of empty nest, um, women having a chance to sort of reinvent themselves, if you like. Mm -hmm. That was the gift with that. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's just, they just seem, I don't know where ideas come from. Does anybody? I think if I knew no. that, I'd, I'd, I'd be very wealthy. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just kind of get a feeling for a place or a time or a, or a, an area or a sort of maybe a world that mm -hmm. I enjoy and would like to spend time in. But I mean, are you, are you like, you you said earlier that, um, you know, you can get, you, you know where the story's going, so it can kind of start to 
you want to escape to the other to the next story. But do you have a, a notebook full of ideas or do you wait until you've finished one and then start working on the next Oh, one? no, I have ideas all the time. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Things pop up mm -hmm. and you just think, oh, yeah. And some, sometimes just one small thing can just trigger a whole, you know. Yeah, bit, absolutely. To your head. Um, and well, so sometimes you can have one idea and then it needs another idea to sort of collide with it. Yeah, to, you to then kind of suddenly... ignite it. Yeah, but, exactly. Yeah, but sometimes it's, it just comes fully formed and you just think, right, there are the characters, that's their dilemma or their, you know, particular situation. The story's all there, which is, yeah, how we, that's how we like it. <laughs> do you ever, I, mean, I mean, how do you... Paris how do it. you know when you've got, like, an idea but that's that's not quite ready how do you know when an idea is ready to be written and, and, and that it's got enough meat to it or, or yeah enough of a i mean that is, to it? that is the hard bit really and that's where having an editor and an agent helps because you can kind of start you can brainstorm a little bit with them yeah yeah um and just get a bit of input and think is this enough you know sometimes you know the inciting incident might be great but as we all know it's that bit in the middle that's the yeah hard horrible thing. wasteland kind of, of this yeah, biggest you, crap you know what's going to happen at the beginning. You know where you want them to get to. But lots of exciting things happen in have to happen in between. And if the characters aren't interesting enough and their situation isn't interesting enough or where they are isn't interesting enough, it will just fizzle out. <clears throat> and yeah, that's always a... Well, that's the hard work, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And I think, to be fair, that's where so many people that say, I'm going to write a book, they get stuck in that. They, 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 can, they have an exciting idea for to start it and then suddenly they hit that middle bit and that's the difficult that's bit it. To, I would say to anybody with. can start a book <laughs> yeah anybody yeah, can exactly. start a really great first chapter and it's always yeah. it's about 30,000 words in that you start going oh, oh, oh. yeah and the other ideas are suddenly becoming <laughs> yeah, really attractive yeah. yeah this is rubbish <laughs> but yeah that's where you have to just push on through and you know and do you have like kind of tent up. pools that you're like I need to get it through because I know I'm going to have this is moment's going to happen or there'll be this incident in 20,000 words and, and and to keep you pulling through to that kind of wasteland middle that kind of moments of storyline that you're going to aim towards as you're writing through yeah and that's when when kind of plotting it all out does help because you want to get to the juicy bits and and yeah. I've sort of realized that all that what I call bread and butter stuff the boring bits that have to happen before the exciting bits happen I've realised that you can dismiss quite quickly in a, <laughs> in a few lines <laughs> and not get bogged down in it. Yeah. yeah. Really yeah. To, like, oh, she went to university. And then she, yeah, actually, you can just go and then <laughs> and just cut to the chase a bit more. Um, I mean, is that is, that but, sounds like something from TV. Is that is that your kind of TV maybe. background being like, you know, cut as close to the kind of action as you need to? I guess, something? I guess. But I also... Um, I really object to that kind of whole Hollywood. It's all got to go this pick because part of the joy of writing books is 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 the writing, mm -hmm. the description, and the slow. You know, I mean, I know thrillers are very like movies, short chapters, boom, 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 cliffhangers. Um, but you know, I'm I'm not writing books like that. I'm writing an experience, if you like. Mm -hmm. I want them to be a you know to be having breakfast with that person and gazing at the view and dipping their granary bread into their boiled egg whatever yeah <laughs> no, and that, let's not forget about the words yeah it's, absolutely it, it, well like like we were saying earlier that's that's the sort of thing that yeah does differentiate a book from a script and is the sort of thing that mm. you know done well is what draws you into a book is mm. is that sort of thing and you want you know when you, there's nothing like reading a good book when you actually want to spend time with these characters and you want yeah. to dive back into that world that's that's when you know you've got a book that you that you love and that's i think what as writers we all we're all aiming for no matter what type of genre that that, that we're absolutely. writing absolutely but it is yeah it's just a balancing act and that's absolutely when the editor comes in and goes yeah ronnie you've been going on about that for too long <laughs> <laughs> not that she ever dare say that <laughs> but yeah <laughs> and uh, and so so 30 days in paris is out uh, soon and then what what is next in the in the pipeline um well i've just finished the first draft but i can't say anything too much yet sorry <laughs> no that's that's fine not that it's a massive secret but <laughs> i just want to be more confident about how to pitch it before i do you know yeah, there. no, no, absolutely. Uh, so, I mean, but you have got, you've got 
like how far in advance, I suppose, is what I'm asking, is the next book? Yeah, so the next book, I've just delivered it and that will come out this time next year. So, right. yeah, okay. I work a year in hand, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, cool. there's still lots to be done. And, and uh, would you ever want to go back to this green writing side of things? Or are you happy in the novel world? I mean, it, uh, what I'm doing at the moment does keep me busy, but... Yeah, sometimes I'm tempted. Sometimes I'm tempted, but it's a it's quite a brutal world script writing. It's mm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's leave that there. <laughs> what was the last book that you read? The last book I read is right here. Actually, it's called uh, The Daughters of Madurai. Um, but I think it's a debut by Rajasri Varyar. Okay. Um, and it's the most beautiful book set in between Sydney and Madurai in India. Um, two timelines, and it's basically about female infanticide. You know how oh, I know that sounds terrible. Uh, it's actually the most beautiful book um, about a very serious issue. You know, oh, yeah. baby girls are not treasured and valued or weren't. Mm -hmm. um, we're obviously working towards that not being a thing anymore um but it's just so evocative you can smell india and it. it's just beautiful it's just it's colorful and and not as horrendous at all as it i mean it's a serious subject but yeah it's really sensitively handled and very uplifting wow okay, okay. Cool. Yeah. Nice. yeah um what about the last film that you watched film Oh, I think it's got to be the Banshees of Anna Sherrod. Oh, yes. yeah, I love that. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I'm just such a massive fan of Colin and um, Brendan. Yeah, speaking as if I know them. <laughs> <laughs> Big C. Yeah, but uh, you know, I'd watch them read the phone book. It's just, I thought it was magnificent. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Really. Really. They are. They are like amazing at doing that kind of really dry, oh. depressing humor. That kind of. You know, it's never it's it's well, very weird, but yeah. Yeah, it is. Weird. I mean it's not 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 everybody gets it, I don't think, but um and of course Martin McDonough is the, the genius behind it, I guess. Yeah, the yeah, writer. He's fantastic, yeah. Yeah, so there'd be nothing without him, I'm sure. Um but yeah, I was just charmed by it. And and what about uh, the last T V show that you watched or are watching? Oh, let me give you one guess. <laughs> Succession. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> no new... spoilers. I've not watched. Yeah, the new no, no, episode. no, no. Yeah, it's just magical television. Really, it is. I'm enjoying it more than season three. I, I wasn't a massive fan of third season. I kind of a bit confused by it all, and it, it never really got going. But about season four so far, I feel like is. Yeah, much, I do get a bit baffled by all the business stuff, but I don't think. I mean, makes... whenever they kind of like backstabbing stuff, I'm like, I don't understand this backstabbing <laughs> plan you're doing. I hate the word shares and stuff are getting thrown about, and <laughs> okay, cool. I just, I'm just going to go with it. It's fine. <laughs> it's just the... they're being horrible to each other. That's they're being really horrible, know. and there's people <laughs> yeah. go over, and there's a lot of money involved, and that seems yeah. to be yeah. the it's just it. genius and just so. Th and and I'm, you know, I'm sure you miss half of it. It's so quick, isn't it? It's so. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. It's, like, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's a brilliant half. show. Uh, well, the, ways. <laughs> the, the very very last thing we do is a, is a super quick fire either or oh god and i would say there's no right answer here apart from one so we'll start off with uh screenwriting or novel writing novel writing um tv or cinema Ooh. i love a trip to the cinema we have a lovely tiny little cinema near here that we there's a bunch of us and we just go quite regularly cool. to keep it alive nice. yeah um, night owl or early bird? Oh, sadly, I'm an early bird now. I'm really dull and boring. I mean, I I can be forced to stay, stay at home. <laughs> <laughs> it takes some getting over, but but I quite I I especially now the clocks have changed and everything's mm, lighter. I do. It's nice in the morning, isn't it? Yeah. I do like a an early you know early morning. Do Do you normally do your writing early in the morning? Or? Yeah, the sooner I can start, the better. Really, I'm you know I'm I could sort of change the world. I'm rising. Yeah. <laughs> One of those really annoying, fully awake people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about music or no music when you're writing? Oh, I can't do music when I'm writing. I mean, I'm a massive music lover, in fact, which is probably why it's too distracting for words. Mm -hmm. I'm like, who's that? What's that? Um, yeah. Remembering things or yeah, no, 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 I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, last one: audiobook or ebook? Oh, I think. I 
love audiobooks and that probably goes back to being a starting my career in radio but radio yeah so i just think they're great and they're just so well produced these days so you know, yeah yeah and i'm very proud that, of my readers of 30 days in paris who oh nice amelia fox and tuppence middleton so i'm like wow <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Books, they always become kind of like radio dramas somehow yeah, exactly. like it's multiple kind of casts like... and yeah yeah really... phone call sound effects or or, or uh, there's one that was someone's on, on a phone and every time they cut to the person on the phone the voice was kind of further away like they were oh. a telephone line that was it was it was nice yeah it's, it's i'm a, a big fan of them yeah no so yes audiobook i think so Tarek, it sounded almost like you would pick an audiobook over an ebook yourself there i'll tell you what i would do marco i would pick an a certain audiobooks over ebooks i would say ebooks are consistent you know what you're getting with an ebook. You, you know the font is the same, the quality of the of the text is the same, as in the actual physical quality, not the writing. <laughs> but the uh, with an audiobook, it can be. I've had some great experiences and I've had some dreadful experiences, uh, based on the narrator, I suppose, probably. And uh, yeah, so, well, a good fair. audiobook can be really, really immersive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, interesting to note that one. <laughs> uh, it's sort of a, a strike against your. I just like campaign. I just like the good stuff. I, I I'm, I'll, I'll take anything. Um, but thanks very much to Veronica for coming on to the podcast. That was a really interesting chat, and you know, interesting to hear starting out in TV back then, and she was having to do sound effects and things like that as well. Yeah. Um, and then obviously moving on to become a best-selling author as well so you can pick up her books now 30 days in paris is her latest and we'll put a link in the podcast description so you can do that but next week we have another brilliant guest and we're moving more towards crime yes we're moving into the crime world next week with graham mccree burnett who is a scottish author um his uh, big book of course his bloody project is one that a lot of people will know um and one book or book, shortlist you know, book or shortlist sorry yeah, yeah. Well, shortlist for booker prize um and it's a fantastic book and it's a really interesting chat we have with him about uh, his writing process how we got in and and what it's like i suppose writing because it's a tiny publisher that put that book out and it became Sarah massive, Band. So, yeah. Sarah Band, yeah so yeah it, it's, but, it's, it's a good chat and also interesting because he's someone that found success quite, you know, it's quite uh, mm -hmm. hopeful for the likes of me. He, he, he found success <laughs> late, later on in, yes. in his writing journey, I guess. Um, and he talks about, you know, the struggles to get there and also the huge impact that being even on the short list of the booker can yeah. make. Um, or and he, I should also say that he, not only has he been shortlisted for his bloody project, I think, was it case study was also long case listed. Study, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, he he is a, a top writer and a great guy, very funny as well. So please do tune in for that one next week. Yep. Um, if you enjoyed today's episode or any of our previous episodes, please do take time to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or your favourite podcast app, as that helps us to continue to get great guests on the podcast. And if you'd like to get in touch. Uh, with us you can do so in a variety of ways that marco spends most of his life now managing so let's go for it email you can head us at uh, podcast at rightgear.co.uk twitter you can find us uh you've, you've not taken the shortcut that i gave you last week no it's at so it's at uk page one uh -huh. and that is our twitter handle yep our threads handle our threads handle our blue, our sky, blue sky handle, handle. and for mastodon you find us at uh, writing.exchange forward slash at page one pod. Yeah. The, the, really, you... at, and even at Instagram is, is at UK page one. So we're mainly oh, right, okay. at UK so page one. So it's just one. at UK page one. Everything. It's only Mastodon and then YouTube are, are slightly different. But, just, um, we'll... just search page one on the internet and <laughs> we'll be there. I could make it easier for you because all of these links are in the podcast description. So you could just say Oh, that. well, this is as far as I've heard of it, Marco. <laughs> Christ. <laughs> but um yeah but thanks for tuning in and we will be back next week with another great episode see you later well i hope you enjoyed that episode if you did please leave a comment down below hit that thumbs up button and be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below and if you want to get in touch you can always drop us a tweet in the twitter machine which is at uk page one as evidenced here and our other social media channels are available 
Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later.